Hi, welcome back to True Crime Tuesday. Sorry I was a little bit MIA over the last two weeks. Um, I went away, I should have pre-filmed some stuff, but life has been super hectic, but I wanted to jump on here and do another South Australian case for you guys. Next week, I promise that I will have something different for you. It's also really difficult for me to film um, every week because I like to film here, and I'm only here every second week, so I have to try and film two in one week, and that's really difficult when it's a lot of research that I need to do and editing. So I'm pretty sure majority of you would have heard of the Snowtown murders before, or also known as Bodies in the Barrels. I prefer to go by maybe Bodies in the Barrels because it's really unfortunate for Snowtown that they have got this really bad stigma on them when none of the murders actually, I think only one of the murders happened in Snowtown and none of the residents even lived there or the murderers. So I feel kind of bad for them, but obviously this is where the bodies were stored and that's why they got their name. In 1999 in Snowtown, South Australia, there were eight bodies found in a bank. Their bodies were stored in barrels. This is one of the biggest serial killer murder cases within Australia. A pile of missing person reports actually led to the discovery of um, the bodies, but we will jump into all of that now. So I want to introduce you to John Bunting. Now he's the mastermind behind all of this. He was born on the 4th of September 1996 in Inala, Queensland. At the age of 8, Bunting was sexually assaulted by one of his friend's older brothers. You tend to find in a lot of murder cases that the victims have suffered sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse um, growing up. Not always, but it is quite common. Due to that abuse, um, Bunting created a massive hatred toward pedophiles and homosexuals. Growing up, he found a passion for anatomy, weapons, and photography. At 20, he worked at a crematorium and he worked with human cadavers. That means unclaimed bodies, pretty much. So people that, like John Doe's or bodies that people don't want or people don't know, even people that like can't afford a burial. At 22, he worked at the SA Meat Corporation where he slaughtered animals and bragged to his friends about how fun it was. During this period, he lived with Kevin Reed and Reed's girlfriend. Now they had a bull terrier dog. Buntings one day decided to slaughter it and he did. January 1989, Veronica Tripp met John Bunting and that September they got married. She had a teenage son named James. He was from a previous relationship. Later in life, Bunting's married Elizabeth Harvey. I did a bit of research on her and I couldn't really find much. Um, a lot of this case is a little bit confusing. It's so all over the place because there's so many victims and so many people. Now I want you to remember these names. We've got Robert Wagner. He befriended Bunting in 1991. We've got James Velasicus. Now he was the son of Elizabeth Harvey that John married. He lived with John, his mother, and his half-brother. Now we've got 48-year-old Jodie Elliott. She was said to have been having a sexual relationship with John Bunting at the time of her son's disappearance. His name was Fred Brooks. He disappeared on September 18, 1998. And that's my birthday. <laughs> and Mark Hayden. Now Mark Hayden was the man that actually rented out the bank space. Now I'm going to get into the storyline. I don't want this to be too confusing at all. Um, writing it down was very confusing, getting so many different sources. And I also just want to say that there is, I don't want you to, I don't want to, if I mispronounce something or I say the wrong thing by accident, um, it's up to you to do your own research before you make any decisions on this case or before you say anything to me. But I've tried to do as much research as I possibly can and come up with the most real story and footages and photos and all of that. Before you want to watch this, I want to let you know that it's quite disturbing. It's graphic. Um, some words are foul and rude. So if you are very sensitive to those type of things, I probably recommend not watching this. The officer in charge of the police major crime section, Paul, instructed some of his police officers during a rest time, which was obviously rare, um, to go through some old missing person case files. 
One of those files was Clinton Trezise. He disappeared in 1992 and spent most of his childhood growing up in foster care. He was recorded missing for three years at this point. Trezise was one of Bunting's first victim. Bunting killed him with a hammer after accusing him of being a pedophile. Bunting's referred to him as the happy pants. In 1994, his body was found at Lower Lights and at this stage, Bunting had no connection to this murder. During their research into Clinton, they came across a missing persons case called Barry Lane. Police figured it out very quickly that there was a connection between the two. In early 1990, they actually lived together and it was suspected that they had some sort of physical relations. Barry was 42 at the time and was said to be Wagner's life partner. According to Bunting, Lane assisted in the disposal of Trezise's body. Though Bunting disliked the man, he sat down for hours and had normal conversations with him. They discussed pedophiles um, with whom he was familiar with. With the names given, Bunting added them to his spider wall. It was pretty much a room in his house where he had pictures and names and descriptions of pedophiles, homosexuals, Pretty much people that he hated. In October 1997, Buntings and Wagner beat Lane. They tortured him in various ways. Amidst the brutality, they made him call his elderly mother. She recalled hearing a muffled voice amidst the laughter and giggles from obviously Bunting and Wagner. Lane said on the phone that he was moving to Queensland and once the call hung up, they strangled him to death rolled him up in a rug and disposed of his body in a barrel. Now both of these men that have already been killed were on a disability pension. Once the police had obviously connected the two dots, they went to the bank. They checked on the withdrawals that were made from Barry's account and there was quite a recent amount of withdrawals from his pension money. They only knew at this point that he was missing and for a missing person to still be taking out money at this local bank made absolutely no sense. So police installed um, security cameras at the bank where this person was withdrawing money and quickly after they found that it wasn't Barry withdrawing this money, it was actually Robert Wagner. Police followed Robert Wagner from the bank which led them to the home of John Bunting on Waterloo Corner at Salisbury East. Around this same time, Elizabeth Haydon, who was 38, was reported missing November 1998. She was the wife of Mark Ray Haydon. After she went missing, family and friends said that she locked herself in her bedroom after Bunting refused her advances. She later went to be with her boyfriend. Um, that was all that was said. When police went to her home, they interviewed her husband, Mark. He claimed that their marriage was no longer and that she had just picked up and left. Within his statement, he also did mention a familiar name of Joe Bunting and he had apparently come over to their residence quite a few times. Detectives started to feel pretty funny about this case that it was more than just missing people. Their fears were realized when they made quite a discovery at Elizabeth Hayden's home. They learned that there was a full drive Land Cruiser in the driveway that had been seen having things loaded into it and then never returning. They described a man with the description of Bunting and Wagner loading up this full drive with garbage bags around the exact same time that she disappeared. I don't know how that how that doesn't like come up until now. It was really important for them to find the Land Cruiser at this time because it went missing at the exact same time that she did, seen having garbage bags loaded into it and that could break her case really. It was the deciding point between murder and missing. In 1995, police began to link so many more disappearances that had the connection to Bunting and Wagner. What started as a straightforward five person missing case turned into a massive police hunt. They finally had enough evidence to go to court and get listening devices put on their phone. It was heard that the two men were heading up to Snowtown, so they also went. Like I said earlier, Snowtown is a small rural community about an hour and a half away from the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And as we know, John Bunting lived in the Salisbury area. That is approximately an hour and 37 minute drive there and then another hour and 37 minute drive back that he was making 
to dispose of these bodies. The population in Snowtown is filled with mostly old farmers, retirees, people from the surrounding areas. When detectives came to Snowtown on Railway Terrace, they noticed there was a lot of old cars. You know, they're like gone. They're almost not drivable and while looking around they noticed a Land Cruiser. They put two and two together and it was the Land Cruiser that was last seen as at Elizabeth's home. Finally, there was a link between Bunting, Hayden and Wagner. It took about six months for them to find this Land Cruiser, but it was worth the search. They spoke to the owner on the premises where the Land Cruiser was found and he did in fact know Buntings. This man told detectives that those men had rented out an old bank in Snowtown and that the Land Cruiser was filled with black barrels. The time that everyone had been waiting for, they think that they've finally cracked the case. They head over to the bank, which is located right near the middle of Snowtown. Between 2008 and 2014, the bank has not changed. I think I've heard that it's since been sold and it is now being used, but since that period, it has not changed. Detectives walk us through their entrance into the bank. There is footage, I'm not sure if I can put it, but if I can, I will do it now. They say that behind the bank counters was a vault door that had a black tarp leading into it, sticky tape, and as they entered it, there were six large black barrels, packets of rubber, rubber gloves, and bottles of acid. When police opened the first barrel, there was a mummified foot facing bottom up. From memory, I don't think anything smelt bad when they went in there. It was going to be a massive job for pathologists to find out who these people are, how they were killed, how many people are in there. As forensics got to work, detectives arrested John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and Hayden. All of these men were linked to the missing people and all three refused to say anything to their arresting officers. All right, I'm back. I went a little MIA for a second. I had someone come over, but I'm here and I'm ready to film again. <laughs> Following all the media coverage that this obviously got, um, police received a tip from a caller that was saying to check out a house at Salisbury North and the person that called up said that they're probably gonna find a body there. So of course, detectives head out there and they start using a little like scanner thing, which pretty well, it says like if soil has been moved, if things have been buried, kind of like the grounds have been upset pretty much. And they got a reading under a water tank. So they dug there and they found trash bags and the remains of a body. Those remains were Susan Allen. Now she was a former lover of Bunting's. From what I've heard, she was infatuated with him and she went missing in November 1996. Within hours of finding her body, they found another set of remains, Ray Davies. Now he lived in a caravan on Susan's property and was alleged to have sexually assaulted her grandchildren. Wagner strangled him alongside Buntings. Now the address of the two bodies were found was where Buntings actually used to live. Now, as this investigation, obviously, it was continuing, they were doing lots of research into who was inside those barrels. Now, Buntings had mixed them with acid. You need a lot of acid to decompose a human body. And obviously, I think it's like 90% of the human body is water. So they didn't decompose as he obviously wanted. This allowed detectives to be able to identify people via their fingerprints, tattoos, and unfortunately they could, unfortunately, fortunately, they could see the way that the victims were killed. So what started as five missing people turned into a multi-murder inquiry. The police had already established that two out of the five people were dead with the three remaining individuals unknown. Detectives were shocked when forensics said that there was actually eight bodies in the barrels. Now police became aware of a man called James Velasic. I'm just gonna get into a little bit of a backstory quickly um, so I can introduce James to you. In 1994, Bunting, he had this hobby of skinning cats and dogs. Lots of cats and dogs, even if they were owned by his neighbor or the man across the street. 
He enjoyed it so much that he encouraged his son, James Tip, not the James we were talking about before, but he encouraged his actual son to watch this. Also in 1994, Bunting met Elizabeth and her 14 year old son, James Velasic. That is where he comes in. In 1995, the next year, Bunting had Elizabeth and James move into his home. Almost immediately, this 15 year old boy, I presume he was 15 at the time, and Bunting started vandalizing people's homes. People that they expected to be dirties, as in gay. And remember I said that he had a spider's web kind of thing going on? James also helped with that, putting up names and images of people that they suspected were gay. That year, Bunting's actually admitted to James that he had killed a man, and that man was Ray Davies. He recounted to James that James' mother, Elizabeth, had actually stabbed Ray in the leg, just before saying that Wagner, his mutual friend, had strangled him to death with jumper cables. James had endured sexual violence when he was younger, unfortunately, as well, and to him, John Bunting was a hero, like a knight in shining armour, getting rid of these disgusting gay men in the world, as they would call them. James actually helped with almost every single murder. Later years in a court testimony, Velasquez stated that according to Bunting's story, Bunting and Wagner loaded Davies unconscious from a truck of a Holden Torano, drove 90 minutes to the northeast to a residence of the town Bakara. I think that's how you say it. They tossed Davies into a bathtub and proceeded to bash him in the genitals. The end of a pole resulted in the man's death. That is disgusting. I can't believe what it would be like for a family to find that that ha happened to some their loved one. Bunting's instructed his victims to call him God, Master and Lord Sir. Bunting's and all of his helpers, associates, they all spied on and studied these families even years before they actually murdered them. A lot of the victims were actually killed inside their own homes and the ones that weren't were lured by something that they were interested in. For example, one of the boys I think was lured via being told about a computer, I'm not 100% sure. They forced victims to record tapes before they died. They did that so that they could send those recordings to family members to convince them that these people were still alive and that they just ran away. Now from my knowledge, almost every single one of these victims were on some sort of a pension or they were gay pedophile. And the killers actually racked up $95,000 off of their pensions pretty much. That was not their primary source for killing, it was because they were gay. On Monday the 8th of September 2003, quite a lot of years later, the jury reached their verdict. Bunting and Wagner were found guilty on all counts except the murder of Suzanne Allen. On that count they couldn't reach a verdict. Bunting and Wagner claimed that she had died of natural causes and that they had buried her. The evidence wasn't solid enough for them to prove otherwise so the judge commented that because they had been killing for pleasure, they were both sentenced to life of imprisonment with no chance of parole. Some also saying that there's no way of ever being able to change them. They're never gonna get better. Mark Hayden was eventually convicted in assisting in the murders. He received a sentence of 28 years. So I presume he'll be out in about seven years. So now pretty much we know where they've hid their bodies, how they drove them there, who was involved. But I want to elaborate more on the victims that were actually lost during all of this. The people, you know, the families that lost their loved ones. I want to go through who they are um, from the information that I could find online and how they unfortunately left the world. And I'm going to go in order on who was killed first to last. I'm going to read it off my computer because I don't want to get anything wrong and I want it to be memorialistic type of thing, like I want you to see photos of them and yeah. First we'll start with Clinton. Now he was 22 at the time. He was the first victim of John Bunting. His body was buried in a town near Adelaide in 1994. He was killed by a hammer by Bunting and 
Wanting also accused him of being a pedophile. Next is Ray Davies. Davies was 26 at the time and he lived on a property of a pensioner named Susanna Allen who was also another one of the victims. He lived in a caravan and was alleged to have sexually abused her grandchildren. He was strangled to death by Warner alongside Bunting. Susanna Allen was aged 46. She lived in the Salisbury North, a former lover of Bunting. She was still infatuated with him um, when she disappeared in November 1996. She was found dismembered in the same hole as Davies. I've actually read a few different things that they weren't in the same spot and some that they were. Michael Gardiner. Now we haven't heard much about him, but he was 19 at the time, a homosexual dress crosser. He lived in a close neighborhood. He was a homosexual cross dresser and a close neighbor of Wagner. He disappeared December 1997. He was tortured and strangled to death and then placed in a barrel. Next is Barry Lane. He was 42 at the time. He was Wagner's life partner. According to Bunting, Lane assisted in the disposal of Teresa's remains. Though Bunting hated the men, they had lots of good chats together. They became well acquainted. They talked about pedophiles and he helped him add to his spider wall. In October 1997, Bunting and Wagner beat Lane and tortured him in various different ways with pliers. Amidst the brutality, they forced him to call his mum. And she also put a statement out there saying what she heard while on the phone. Lane was strangled to death, rolled up in a rug, then transported and disposed in a barrel. Thomas Trevelyan, he was age 18 at the time. We also haven't talked much about him. He was schizophrenic. He was a member of the cohort and intended to appear as a suicide. Trevelyan was hanged from a tree at a crate near his feet outside Kerr's book on November 5th, 1997. He had threatened Bunting's daughter with a knife, which had upset Bunting greatly. Trevelyan had been considered a liability for some time by the cohort. He continually bragged to outsiders. Gavin Porter, another one we haven't really heard much about. He was age 29, he was a drug addict who lived with Velasix, then Bunting and Velasix. On the night of his murder, Velasix took Porter's two younger brothers to a drive-in movie. According to Velasix, when the three returned from the movie, Bunting's took Velasix outside and into the backyard shed, where he had displayed Porter's corpse, a rope clinched tightly around his neck. Next to Porter's corpse sat a barrel, inside of which were the bodies of Gardner and Lane. Buntings and Velasix stuffed Porter's body into an empty barrel, which was then filled with Bunting's choice of cor corrosive compounds. Next is Troy Yord. Now, he was killed in 1998. Um, Buntings, Wagner and Velasic killed um, the latter's half-brother. Um, he was 21 at the time. According to Velasic, Yude had molested Velasix when Velasix was 13 years old, so another pedophile. Frederick Brooks, he was 17 at the time. In July, him and his mother Jody Elliott moved onto the neighborhood. Despite him being related to a member of the crew, Mark Haydon, Buntings took an immediate dislike to the teenager, labeling him a dirty, as in gay. In September of that year, Velasix, Wagner and Bunting tortured the young Brooks. They handcuffed him, thumbcuffed him, they beat and tortured him, forced him to call them vaunted titles, lit cigarettes and inserted them into his ears and his nostrils, lit a sparkler and shoved up his penis. He was made to speak into a record device, including the, his banking information and that he molested young girls. And there is so much more horrible, horrible things that I'm not gonna read out. I'm sure you can do your own research if you wanna know. Gary O'Dwyer was 29 at the time. He was a mentally impaired man who had a pronounced limp. He would walk the streets. Bunting was heard calling him a fag. He simply didn't like O'Dwyer. In late October 1998, Velasix convinced O'Dwyer, his next door neighbor, to invite him. Bunting and Wagner over for a drink. Drinks were dragged into the kitchen where he tortured, where he was tortured. He was murdered. After several days, his corpse was stuffed into a barrel. Next is Olivia Haydon. We've talked about her. Um, she found herself alone when, um, on November 21st, 1998, Bunting and Wagner called to her residence. Um, her husband and children had gone out. 
Later, Buntings would say that she was behaving brazenly towards them, so she needed to be killed. She was killed with a rope, gagged, strangled. When they showed her husband her remains, he laughed. Next is David Johnson. He was 24, Velasic's stepbrother. They lured him to a shuttered bank where Wagner and Bunting hid. Johnson was strangled for the time, then handcuffed, was forced to read a fabricated list of confessions for his crimes and acts. Wagner cooked up bits of his flesh and ate them with friends. But that's all I have on this case today. I really hope that you enjoyed listening to it and I hope that it opened people's eyes to this case and that you feel for the victims and I hope to see you in next week's video. Bye. The officer in charge of the police has made it disposable. It's disposal. Disposal, Cleo. Disposal. Just about every man and their dog is walking past right now.